is the story that rocked America. In an exclusive all-new Oz, the Ashley Madison cheating scandal, a beloved pastor outed as a member of the notorious website who just committed suicide. Now his wife speaks out for the first time. What do you have to say to the hackers? And the difficult conversation spawned by this controversy. Coming up next. It's the scandal everyone's talking about. The Ashley Madison hack has sent shockwaves across the globe, hitting marriages hard. And today, in an exclusive interview, you will hear from the wife of the pastor who killed himself just days after being outed by the hackers. And she has a message for every family in America. The impact is not isolated to just her family or to the celebrities that you're reading about in the papers. Aftershocks of this scandal are being felt by just about every married person. And that can affect their well-being. The connection between healthy relationships and health is now really f firmly backed up by hard science. For example, happily married people have lower mortality rates. They die less often. They have a lower risk of depression, heart disease, cancer, all the big killers, even a lower incidence of the everyday flu. Now, the connection is hard to deny, and that's why the Ashley Madison cheating scandal is also potentially a health crisis. It has forced couples all over America to ask, could infidelity enter our home? Well, we're going to explore the Ashley Madison effect on the show today. Also, the science of cheating. Why do we do it? And how do we do things to get past it? And the cheating death issue. It's one of the times that cheating is actually a good thing. We're going to meet a pregnant woman who died for 37 seconds during childbirth. Find out how she followed her intuition and it brought her back to life. We begin with the deadly Ashley Madison effect. It's the hacking scandal rocking America. Act like Snooki and Kristen Takeman of Real Housewives of New York City. Professional athletes, politicians, CEOs, and tens of millions of others. Reportedly 32 million. The fallout has been devastating. It's called the Ashley Madison effect. Marriages ripped open, trust broken, and even health compromised. Interrupted sleep, increased stress, and now suicide. Pastor John Gibson took his life when his secret was exposed. Found by his wife just six days. Dad, he was my hero. Gibson, a father of two, preacher and professor, was loved by everyone in the community, even though he wasn't perfect, says his son Trey. My dad was a great man. He was a great man with struggles. Everyone has struggles. Everyone is broken. When the pastor's suicide note was found, the family's worst fear was realized in just two words, Ashley Madison. Gibson's wife thinks guilt and fear of losing his job drove her husband to the unthinkable. Today, Pastor Gibson's family is speaking out for the first time to share their memories and to make sure this tragedy doesn't happen to anyone else. Christy, I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. And I know it's difficult. It's a private tragedy. It's become pretty public. Mm -hmm. Are you holding up okay? I am. Getting through it. Getting through it. One step by at a time. Yeah. The man you loved, the man you were married to for 29 years, tell us about him. He was, um, I think the first thing you're ever going to hear to describe him is that he was a servant. He had such a servant's heart. He um, loved to do for everyone. He had a corny, quirky sense of humor laughed at life, kept us all laughing, um, was a good friend. Take me back to the day when you found him. It was um, Monday, actually, three weeks ago, and um, I came home from work, and I was running a little late, and we had plans for supper that night, and so when I walked in the house, there were a few clues to the manner in which he, he killed himself. So I began to look for him around the house and um, eventually found him and he was gone. He had been gone probably for several hours and we, there was no CPR, nothing, because he was just very, very clearly gone. I immediately um, pulled out my cell phone and called my best friend who lives down the street and she came and we called 
the emergency services and the house began to fill up with friends and it was a pretty tough day. Did, did it ever cross your mind he might take his life? I don't know that it ever did seriously. There were times probably through the years that he would, he would jokingly say that we would be better off without him in, a, in kind of a half-joking way. Um, but I don't, I don't know that I ever seriously contemplated that he would. And I know he left a note, and this is sensitive, uh, so you say what you are comfortable saying. But he outlined some of why he was doing what he was doing. He basically was a very brief note, and he basically said that he had struggled with depression and that he had been on the Ashley Madison website mm. and that he was so very sorry. And that was really about it, a few um, instructions for how to handle his death. And that was really it. So he mentioned the Ashley Madison website. He did. Do you think he was fearful of losing his job as a pastor? I think quite naturally he would be. He um, was very, he, he very much loved his job. He very much loved ministering to people, ministering to students. He never wanted to be anything but a pastor and a professor. And of course, being on, an, on a website for infidelity doesn't go with that. And so of course, I think the minute the leak happened, he had to be afraid that his name was there and that, he, that this would threaten everything. Do you think he was worried about losing you? I had forgiven him in the past. This is not a first time struggle. I had forgiven other things and I hope that he would have known that we could work on it together. I had told him over the years that I wanted to work on this with him. I hope that he would have known that, but it, it, it may have been there. There may have been some fear of that as well. Let me ask Trey a question. Uh, Chrissy's and John's son, Trey, is here. Trey, I, I heard you speaking at the, the memorial service, mm -hmm. the burial perhaps. Your father was obviously in great pain as he was going through this. If you could talk to him in those darkest moments, what would you have said? Um, he was my dad, and so uh, I would have said, that nothing um, would have been too bad that we would have ever stopped being his kids, that, um, that we would have ever stopped lo um, loving him, um, that it's, um, it wouldn't have been easy, but uh, we would have um, made it through that. So um, I would have loved to make sure that he understood that. Christy, what would you have told John at his darkest moment? I would have said, please, can we work on this together? I would have said that nothing was worth losing him for. He was too important to us. He, he left a hole. And um, yeah, it would have been hard. It would have been hard to deal with the aftermath of all of this happening, but we could have done it. Anything in life that's worth doing is, is hard. If, if John had confessed to you about his Ashley Madison involvement, no. Do you think this would have been avoided? Um, yes, I do. I think this outcome would have been avoided. I think it would have been hard. I think it, um, I, like I said, I'd forgiven him before. I think I would have forgiven him again. Mm -hmm. I, I've been forgiven much. I, I certainly have, have my own faults. We all do our own struggles. Um, I think we could have worked on it together if he would have, if he would have let us. What do you have to say to the hackers whose actions led to your husband's suicide? I would say to the hackers that um, I know that they, um, they feel like they did a good and right thing by outing this. I, I, I guess they do. I guess that was their, their motivation. I don't really know. But there is nothing. Um, good or right about rejoicing in the downfall of another person. And um, so I would say, look to your own life and deal with the, the, what is right and good in your life and maybe your own struggles and your own difficulties that you're dealing with 
and um, we all fall short of what of what we need to be. How are you doing? How do you stay strong? I tell you, it's it's the community, the the Christian community that is surrounding me, um, my family, my my faith um, community. Um, my son and I have talked about it several times that um, we can almost physically feel the arms of others united and holding us up. That we know we don't have any strength in and of ourselves. We feel very weak. We are absolutely exhausted. And the emotional swings, the, the one day we're dealing with anger, one we're dealing with just, just the greatest sorrow that we could ever imagine. Um, and, and, and we're doing all this. We're talking about yeah. what we're doing. So we're doing it all in the public eye. And we have an incredible community of faith that are praying for us, sending us words of encouragement. Mm -hmm. my, my phone blows up every morning with texts of scriptures and praise songs and, and just things to encourage me. Well, you're gonna have millions of people <laughs> praying with you as well today and wishing you the best. I know how difficult this must be. Thank you. Only imagine. We mourn ourselves, I gotta say, uh, when we lose a parent, but when we lose a spouse or a child, we actually mourn losing them prematurely. They were taken before their time. If any of you had a role in it, all right, bless you. Thank you. We'll be right back. Next, are we genetically wired to cheat, or is that just an excuse? Some believe we could actually possess a cheating gene. We are a socially monogamous primate. That doesn't mean we're sexually monogamous. What drives us to cheat? Coming up next. The Miss America nurse controversy explodes. The backlash no one saw coming. Nurses unite in a show of force. Even I weigh in with over 200 nurses strong, all new Oz. That's coming up on Monday. The Ashley Madison hacking scandal has put cheating and cheaters in the spotlight, raising the question, why do people cheat in the first place? So I want to delve deeper into the science of infidelity to find out if we are wired to cheat or if that's just an excuse. Please welcome Dr. Tara Fields, a licensed family therapist and relationship expert. Dr. Justin Garcia, evolutionary biologist at the King's Institute for Sex, Gender, and Reproduction, and someone who unfortunately sees a lot of infidelity in her line of work, divorce attorney, and stars of Bravo's Untying the Knot, Vicki Ziegler. Welcome to the show. So the big question we're asking everybody is why do people turn to websites like Ashley Madison and cheat? Mm -hmm. So the audience may have their own thoughts, but I'd like to hear from the experts. Yeah, I don't think they're nece they necessarily have the intention to cheat <laughs> when they go there. I think they're sort of testing the waters, they're putting their toe in, mm -hmm. but often you start by putting your toe in and the rest of the body follows. And you know what, I think that you're right, but honestly it's so easy to be a digital person behind the computer trying to find people, maybe even putting a different picture from 1990 and trying to f look for people and kind of focus on what you're not getting in your marriage. It's the coward's man out quite kind of thing yeah. where people are actually behind the computer and not actually going in front of people to cheat which is really unfortunate and that's why they need me on a daily basis <laughs> and we know that the risk of infidelity is quite high in societies all around the world and there's a subset of people who are physiologically biologically yeah. not drawn yeah. to monogamy like most of us uh, so why get married then well, yeah, exactly. if we're in a social construct where the institution mm -hmm. says everyone should be getting married, we live in a society where we say let's be monogamous, what gender scholars call monogonormativity, right? So everyone around us gets married, so we think we should do it. Most humans, we are a socially monogamous mm -hmm. primate. That doesn't mean we're sexually monogamous. There are different systems in our physiology and our biology. Okay, but are you I married? Have, yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I have to say, you're great. You're great. Well done. no, I said, are you married? Oh, are you yes. married? And, and I have, have to say, say that have a different perspective, Dr. Oz. Yes. I think a little bit. Okay, but if a husband is really wanting to repair his relationship from an affair and he says it's not my fault my genes made me do it well, that's well, like throwing I wait agree. a minute wait a minute wait a minute that's like throwing gasoline on a fire mm -hmm. and as dr oz knows we could have a genetic predisposition to high cholesterol mm -hmm. and to diabetes mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we should go stuff our faces with cheeseburgers we have personal yeah. choices yeah. Yeah. Well, that's hold, hold right. on. i don't want to go on this path too far because i do want to <laughs> explore a little bit dr garcia's mm -hmm. assertion that there's actually a gene that predicts cheating, call it the cheating gene. 
So you're saying there actually is something like that? So we've done work on, a, we know that, ge that our genetics, variation in our genetics can be associated with certain predispositions for behavior. So if we looked at a gene called DRD4, and it's a gene that regulates dopamine in the brain and the brain's pleasure and reward response. So what we found is that individuals with a certain variant of the DRD4 gene, uh, who are also more likely to engage in sensation seeking and risk taking mm -hmm. and alcohol use and abuse, mm -hmm. are 50% more likely to commit infidelity. And when they do commit infidelity, Fidelity compared to those without the gene, which gets to your point that there's lots of diversity, uh, they do it much more often. And the reason being is that infidelity is a behavior that is high in risk, it is mixed in reward and mixed in motivation. Those are the ingredients that are perfect for a dopaminergic response. And I agree, I agree with you. I agree with you. Doctor, let me just explain this for one second because that was a lot of stuff to be able to process. So there's a gene in the brain. Mm -hmm that predicts how dopamine works. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, let me just, if I can't illustrate this for everyone, because I want you to be clear on this, because the women will go all know like this, it's impossible, <laughs> all right? But let me just explain that so we can get to the debate about whether it's true or not. So let's start with this concept of a gene variation. And let's start with the brain. There it is, there's the brain. And spin it around a little bit. And when you spin it, and you actually cut it in half, in the inside, we're gonna look at something where this dopamine is made. Now, the dopamine's made in a little area that's sort of uh, greenish there, and it's left uh, allowed for, from there to progress to other parts of the brain, to the front of the brain, as you see there, that's how the brain gets excited. Mm -hmm. So people who have that normal function, that's what it's normally supposed to do, they can feel that dopamine surge even when they're making love to their spouse while watching the local news on Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. right? When they be intimate, it's turned on appropriately. But in someone with the so-called cheating gene, as you were talking about, this non-functioning part of the brain, but the dopamine doesn't work quite the way, there's a variation in that blueprint. So it's harder for them to get happy and excited. They don't get that stimulation in this brain the way it's supposed to be stimulated when you're having intimate moments. So they may be more likely to seek excitement elsewhere with another partner outside their marriage. Before you run out and get your spouse genetically tested, which most <laughs> women are thinking of doing right now, the headline I'm hearing from all you mm -hmm. is that that's not actually predicting behavior, it's just of making it understandable in some cases. And you might be more vulnerable. So again, look at this still as a choice. My Absolutely. choice is not to cheat, and maybe I'll bungee jump and try to get that dopamine rush. Absolutely. Problem, but the problem is, Dr. Raz, in, in the d divorce cases, as a divorce attorney, we can't use an excuse that I cheated, I committed adultery, so I have the cheating gene. I'm yes, sorry. Exactly. Sorry about that. You know, my marriage isn't working mm -hmm. out, and judge, you know, that's an issue. You should uh -huh. excuse uh -huh. this behavior. Uh -huh. We yeah. can't do that yeah. Yeah. as counselors um, yes. going before the court. So mm -hmm. we, have to ha we have to really think about things before we get that's into relationships right. and get married. And whether or not you have addictive personality, I'm assuming the gene has something to do with gamblers and people yeah, that like absolutely. a rush a process and all those things. You need exactly. to know yourself mm -hmm. and figure out whether or not you want to be monogamous or not. And if you're going to get married, you need to work on your marriage and stay monogamous or don't get married and have a million girlfriends. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And absolutely. Biology, is, biology is never an excuse for our behavior. It's simply not. You still but have exactly as you said, it allows us to understand why some people feel pulled in one direction mm -hmm. in their behavior mm -hmm. versus those that feel pulled in another. Mm -hmm. We can begin to mm -hmm. understand the drives, the motivations right. to go in one direction. Right. Let's move this to the separate, separate question of whether men Men or women are more likely to do this. Mm -hmm. So there are reports that there are 31 million men who have signed up for Ashley Madison compared to only five and a half women, a million women. Big difference, six to one difference. Are men more likely to cheat than women? I Don't answer. When we come back, you'll find out mm -hmm. the thoughts <laughs> of our experts. <laughs> We're right back. Later in the show, the Ashley Madison scandal has made many question, where does my marriage stand? Should you be searching the hack database for your spouse's email? How to have the difficult conversation with your spouse about infidelity, coming up. Divorce attorney Vic Ziegler, Dr. Garcia, and Dr. Fields. We're talking about the science of infidelity brought into the limelight by the recent Ashy Madison hacking. There were certainly more men on Ashy Madison's website than women. We all know that as a fact, but are men more likely to cheat than women? Yes, I think traditionally, and I think that it changes with society, but in the 1990s, there was a study, Dr. Oz, that showed that 12% of the women cheated in the survey and 23% of the men cheated. However, in a recent study, that number with females has gone up to Absolutely. 19%, yep. and it's plateaued at 23% mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. men. Mm -hmm. And what I'm finding in my practice is that women are more confident. They're out in the workplace. They're actually making money. They're taking care of themselves, and they're saying, listen, if I cheat and I dabble in another relationship and I get caught, the repercussion 
isn't, isn't as daunting. I can still take care of myself as I couldn't perhaps 20 years ago. But I also think men and women cheat for different reasons. You know, when, when a man feels disconnected from himself or his mate, mm -hmm. often he'll use sex as a way to connect. Whereas with, for women, we need to be open emotionally to then feel open sexually. So I think with women, a lot of affairs start with affairs of the heart. They feel like they're getting the communication and then it turns into sex. And with men, it starts with sex. And that's exactly the point. We're starting to understand that the motivations for engaging in sexual infidelity are different for men and women. But new research is suggesting that both men and women engage in infidelity, probably because we know that infidelity is part of the human mating repertoire. Of the 15% of socially monogamous primates, uh, I Almost love being called none. a primate, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. Yeah. Can we talk about it? <laughs> Since you brought up the issue of emotional versus sexual infidelity, what's the difference? Well, the difference is emotional infidelity, there literally is no sex. Somebody can fall in love and they can ro be romanced and romance the other one. And often, there was, there was some research that was done and men and women were asked, what would be more painful? If your mate came home and said, I have something to confess, I had sex once, there was no feeling involved, or your mate came home and said, um, you know, I didn't have sex with this person but I think I fell in love and we've gone out to romantic dinners and all this stuff. Most women said an affair of the heart would be more painful even if there's no sex. And for men, it was a sexual affair. So analyze that. Dr. Garcia, take that back to your primates. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, the complicated piece there is that we know from the research that although psychologists make this distinction between emotional and sexual infidelity, if we ask people, which would you be upset by most and give them the option of saying both, most people say, well, I'd be upset by both uh -huh. because we don't really separate the notions. We do as researchers, but people in their own lives don't often separate the notion of if it's emotional, you start to think, well, it's, it's almost sexual. And if it's sexual, you say, well, it had to also be emotional. Well, when it's personal, there's an issue. It's a lot easier yes. to say, oh, I'm so sorry, yes. you were cheated on, or you know, your girlfriend's emotionally connected to somebody. But when it happens to you, mm -hmm. it's a different story. Absolutely. And, and I think in divorce, and this is you know, the reason why I have to be the voice of divorce here, because that's why I'm here. I think what we're seeing most of the time, people have emotional affairs. Sure. That, to me, can be worse than a sexual affair, because absolutely. sexual affairs can that's be right. fleeting. An emotional connection can be a lifetime. Oh, no, absolutely. Now you have all the fodder you need for your practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for all the insights. Up next, for everyone who's wondered whether their spouse has even flirted with the idea of Ashley Madison, Dr. Fields has advice on how to have the difficult conversation about infidelity in your home. It could make your relationship stronger, and I mean it. That's next. <laughs> Later, is it possible to cheat death? Meet a woman who will make you believe. The amazing story of a mother who trusted her gut while pregnant. How her intuition helped save her and her baby's life. Coming up. The Miss America nurse controversy explodes. The backlash no one saw coming. Nurses unite in a show of force. Even I weigh in with over 200 nurses strong. All new Oz. That's coming up on Monday. We've been talking about the Ashley Madison effect, the emotional and psychological aftershocks being felt by millions. Now, it's not just people being outed for cheating who are being affected. Every married person in America is asking themselves, was my spouse involved? Do I need to look them up on the, on the website? Where does my marriage stand? So I'm going to open it up in today's conversation. Dr. Fields is going to offer up her thoughts on all the questions you may have about infidelity. But you've got to ask the question or there's no answer. Okay. It takes a little bravery. Who wants to go first? Thoughts? Here we are. Go ahead. What if I went on one of those websites to look up my husband and I found my best friend's husband on there? What do I do then? Do I tell her? Do I not? Do that's I get a, involved? That's a great question. How did you even think of that question? <laughs> is no, that, how, is that what your that. mind really was? <laughs> Right. I, I love that question because people ask me all the time, I saw my best friend's husband. What I would do is I would go to him first directly with the information and say, I need you to share this with your wife. If not, I'm going to say something, but give him the opportunity to do it in the most loving way and to come clean. Mm -hmm. oh, and then it, it gets you out of being the bad guy too. That's true, very true. What other questions do you have, I wonder? <laughs> <laughs> go, go ahead. Hi. 
Um, I've been with my husband for almost 12 years, and we've had a really, really happy marriage with mm -hmm. open communication, trust, respect. Mm -hmm. um, but I've got this burning curiosity about whether he has indulged in this website, if he's registered, mm -hmm. and I just um, I need to know how to approach him without mm -hmm. being accusatory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you I'm, help me? I'm wondering why you even have that thought, why you're feeling anxious. I think that it's the Ashley Madison, you know, public publicity, you know, that we've all heard about and it's kind of stirred up a can exactly. of worms for me Exactly, and inside. I think you're like so many women where their husbands probably aren't there, you've got this great trust, but boy, for some reason it's, been a, it's become a trigger. The great thing about even having those feelings is it gives you an opportunity to have another conversation about trust. And I wanna say to the men out there, if your beautiful wife, like this one, says that to you, don't be reactive and say, how could you ask me that? Say, huh. That's kind of interesting. You know, I know we don't have any history of trust issues, but it's an opportunity to get to know your partner. Maybe there's trust issues from the past in a past relationship. Maybe a parent was a treat, uh, cheated and this is a trigger. So it's a way to help your beautiful mate repair this, which creates even more intimacy between you. Dr. Bill, this is the elephant in the room. So let's yes. ask the bigger question, should women search the Ashley Madison website mm -hmm. to find that if their spouse's email is there. I think they need to talk to their mate first. If your mate gets reactive, if you still keep getting that gut feeling, maybe you should do it. But I really think that probably it's a long shot that you need to. You have a question? Mine is just more of a statement. I think cheating is just ridiculous and quite honestly lazy. If you're unhappy, get out. And I think if it's on the internet, it is not private. No, it's not at all. Yeah, that's I think good. that's fantastic because there's never a reason to cheat. If you want to get out of your marriage, turn to your mate, do everything you can to fix it, and then after time, if you know it can't be fixed, get out, and then, just like you said, then you have the relationship. So Liz and Tony are joining us, a husband and wife couple. We've been married two years, if I understand correctly. Yes. And you have a question. Yes, hi, Dr. Fields. Hi. I, I heard about the, the scandal through my husband. He works in IT, so he actually told me about it before it was all over the place. And um, we had a baby two months ago, so my emotions and insecurities were mm -hmm. running high. Mm -hmm. And even though we did talk about it, um, it did cross my mind to see if he was on the website. Ultimately, I didn't because I, I trust him. But what is a good way to start a conversation like that with your spouse? Mm -hmm. So I would say, listen, honey, I, it, this may be all about me. For some reason, I'm hearing this in the news. It makes me feel so anxious. Tony, how did you deal, especially since you're in IT, with the possibility that you might get checked up on? Well, uh, we were open about it. I mean, we were open. This, right. you, know, you weren't disappointed that she was questioning what you'd um, gone there? Well, you know, it, it hurts a little bit. It does hurt. Uh -huh. But at the same time, I know she trusts me, and I trust her in mm -hmm. the same way. Mm -hmm. it, we just talked to each other and basically reassured each other that, you know, this didn't happen. And, you know, honestly, for fun, I just checked myself out. Because my, <laughs> my, my own emails, just because I thought it Was fun. it on there? No. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the but, you go. know, I, I love what you did because instead of going to the anger and becoming reactive, you talked about your pain. You went right to it. You shared it. And that's probably why you have such a great relationship. Last uh, bit of advice for anyone out there who's wondering how to have that conversation tonight yeah. with their spouse. As, as therapists, we always take even the darkest stories and try to reframe it and talk, turn it into something positive. Use this as an opportunity to have that conversation about trust. And you may find something out that you didn't know about your mate it, within the relationship or even from the past, and that's what builds intimacy. Dr. Harefields, The Love Fix, fantastic books available now. Up next, Cheating Death. The amazing story of a woman who trusted her gut in the ninth month of pregnancy, and it probably saved her life. Next, the pregnant woman whose intuition helped her cheat death. I told my doctor there's something wrong. And coming up later, I'm turning your freezer into a breakfast and lunch factory to save you 30 minutes every morning. Coming up. We are bringing healthy back this season and want you to bring it too. Grab your prescription pad for fun and sign up for free tickets today. You can go to DrOz.com slash tickets and sign up.
Today's show is all about cheating, and now, cheating death. My next guest followed her intuition, and it saved her life. I was pregnant with my second child, and we were so excited. At the 20-week ultrasound, I was diagnosed with the placenta previa, which means that the placenta is growing on top of the cervix. The radiologist made it sound like it was a relatively benign uh, issue, at least at that stage of pregnancy, but my wife's reaction was decidedly different. I told my husband, I've got a bad feeling about this. I'm O negative, so less than 7% of the population has this blood type. There was this overwhelming fear that I couldn't shake. When I got home, I had my first vision of what was going to happen to me. It was almost like a film strip. I saw me delivering Jacob, everything being fine with him, and then I would see the doctors slicing me open, blood hemorrhaging, and ultimately, I saw me dead on the operating table. I was convinced that I was not going to make it past this delivery. Everybody thought I was crazy. I did hope that it was nerves and hormones, but it wasn't. I was seeing things, and then I was feeling them physically, and calling my husband or my doctors and saying, I feel like this is going to happen. Every test that I went into that I was having visions about came back negative, everything. There was nobody left to speak to, and my doctor suggested I have a consultation with anesthesia. I told her one last time, this is what I was afraid was going to happen. And with that consultation, she flagged my file and incorporated extra blood in the operating room at the time of delivery. A week shy of my scheduled C-section, I looked down at the floor and blood was everywhere. When Stephanie got to the hospital, she was concerned that something horrible was going to happen to her during her delivery. I was 100% positive my visions were going to come true. We began to make our way to the operating room. My body went ice cold. I told my doctor, there's something wrong. Right after delivery, Stephanie had seizure-like activity. We were calling out her name, and then we noticed that she had no heartbeat and flatlined for 37 seconds. Stephanie suffered an extremely rare complication of pregnancy. It's known as an amniotic fluid embolism, and that causes a series of events that leads to a very significant allergic reaction, a catastrophic hemorrhage. She lost the ability to clot her blood. In order to keep Stephanie alive, during the first 24 hours, she was transfused over 60 blood products. As a result of that phone call, we had a crash cart nearby and enough blood reserved for her. I do believe that that saved Stephanie's life. Please welcome Stephanie. Welcome to the show. So, you obviously were unconscious when you were going through this near-death experience, but you've had I guess hypnosis and other techniques to try to remember what happened. So walk us through for those 37 seconds when your heart wasn't beating, what was going on? So I saw everything that happened in the operating room. So after I flatlined, I saw my doctor screaming, this can't be happening. I saw the anesthesiologist down by my feet and screaming, Stephanie, Stephanie, and running up. I saw that the first crash cart didn't work, but the second crash cart did. I saw a nurse that I'd never seen before jump on my chest and do the compressions. I saw somebody hit the button and call the code, and then 40 doctors rushed into the trauma team. And then ultimately, I, I heard the flat line. How eerie is that? <laughs> probably have an idea as a cardiologist. Yes. <laughs> so you had this intuition. Mm -hmm. you, you have to have a lot of strength to speak up on it, especially in front of your doctors. Right. Well, the way that, that I, I talk about it is I had nothing to lose except my life. So imagine you're on a plane and it's crashing. You're going to do everything you can to save your life. And I needed to do something and talk to anybody. Maybe somebody had heard what I was going through and helped me. So I hear your child, you know, screaming and yelling back there, trying to get out here to mommy. Can I call? Call. Absolutely. So, please Absolutely. meet Jackie, Stephanie's baby, Jacob, and the rest of the family. I think the four-year-old's there too. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> now, are you the little chatterbox back there? No. 
I think that's your voice. I recognize that voice. <laughs> what were you saying back there? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard when you walk out. She was saying, mommy, mommy, I want to go out. <laughs> so uh, Stephanie said a wonderful book is called 37 Seconds. It looks really terrific. You're going to stick around. Okay. All right. Great. When we come back, we're going to talk about the three gut instincts you should never ignore. Later, the best time cheat to shave 30 minutes off your morning routine. The Miss America nurse controversy explodes. The backlash no one saw coming. Nurses unite in a show of force. Even I weigh in with over 200 nurses strong. All new Oz. That's coming up on Monday. There was this overwhelming fear that I couldn't shake. When I got home, I had my first vision of what was going to happen to me. I saw me delivering Jacob, everything being fine with him, and then I would see the doctors slicing me open, blood hemorrhaging, and ultimately, I saw me dead on the operating table. We're back with Stephanie, who cheated death when she trusted her gut that something was wrong with her pregnancy. Also joining us is someone who's done a lot of research on the connection between intuition and health, Dr. Kelly Turner. So what have you learned about intuition's effect on health, Kelly? Well, I study radical remission survivors. These are people who heal from cancer against tremendous odds. And one of the nine things they have in common is following their intuition. And one thing that I really find fascinating is that research has shown that the gut acts like a second brain. So when somebody says, I have a gut feeling about something, that's not just a thought. That's a physical process happening in their body that we're all born with. And it's there to alert us towards danger. Those butterflies mean something. They do. So what advice do you have for folks who are, you know, perhaps a little trepidatious about trusting their instincts, their gut intuition? That they, if they sense something, they need to say something because ultimately it could save their life. As it did in your case. (laughs) It, It most certainly did. The first gut instinct Dr. Turner says you should never ignore is the trust instinct. Right. So we all have the ability to read people. We can read body language, facial expression. We often can get almost an instant read on whether someone is safe or not. That's your intuition talking to you. So intuition doesn't just alert us towards danger. It also points you towards a path of safety or in my research, a path of healing. Second big tip you give us is something that everyone will be familiar with, sweaty palms. So we should never ignore them. You actually wrote about this in your Radical Remission book. Right. So it sounds simple, but your body often knows that there's a problem long before the brain does. Want to demonstrate it? Yeah, I'd love to show you. So a great example is the famous Iowa card study. So this was done at the University of Iowa in their School of Medicine. Is it poker players? Yeah, well, actually it was about gambling. Um, and they were doing more than just watching what they were doing. They hooked these people up to, to sensors. So the point of the game was to win as much money as you could simply by flipping over cards. And you could flip over cards from any deck. But what the participants didn't realize what was it? So, well, we is flip. that it was rigged. Right. It's rigged. So it was rigged. So the red decks were set up to give you big wins followed by big losses. And the blue decks were set up to give you slow and steady wins. Oh. Okay, so it took about 80 cards for the people to figure out what was going on. 80 cards before they knew this was dangerous and this was safe. But here's the crazy thing. Their bodies knew after only 10 cards. Based on the sweating. Based on the sweating. So after 10 cards, whenever they reached for a a card from the red deck, the dangerous deck, the sweat glands on their hands would open up slightly. So their bodies were trying to tell them 70 cards before the brain caught up to it that this was danger. And that's why it's so important to listen to your body because it often knows long before the thinking part of your brain even knows there's a problem. So from now on, be proud of your sweaty palms. Yes. No more shying away from that reality. All right, the third gut instinct we should never ignore is the don't, I don't feel good instinct. Something's not right instinct. Something's not right. Yeah, so this could be a gut feeling. It might be a voice in your head. It might even be a dream. But if you have a nagging feeling that just something isn't right, you really should listen to it, just like Stephanie did. Because this could save your life. A great example of not ignoring this feeling that something might be wrong, in addition to Stephanie's example, is actually Tom Hanks' wife, Rita Wilson. She was recently diagnosed with breast cancer, but it started off with a breast cancer biopsy that came back negative. 
meaning indicating she didn't have cancer, but she couldn't shake that feeling that something wasn't right. So she asked to have the test repeated, and the second test came back positive, hmm. indicating she did have cancer. She ended up needing treatment, and by listening to that intuitive feeling, that thought of something's not right here, it arguably saved her life. I don't know if you knew any of this before, beforehand, I but, <laughs> but you processed it right anyway. I'm so happy you made it, you. especially for those wonderful shoes. Thank you for the wonderful advice, guys. If you're seeing a doctor and you've got a gut feeling about your health, give you a signal that you don't know enough, so don't be afraid to talk to them about it. Keep asking questions that you are satisfied. Up next, a time cheat you can all use to shave 30 minutes off your morning routine. The Miss America nurse controversy explodes. The backlash no one saw coming. Nurses unite in a show of force. Even I weigh in with over 200 nurses strong, all new Oz. That's coming up on Monday. It's been all about cheating, from the Ashley Madison hacking scandal to even cheating death. Now here's a cheat you can use to lower your stress. Tomorrow you're going to be talking about the best time cheat to shave 30 minutes off your morning routine. Now, it's turn it's a, that you're going to love this. You're going to turn your freezer into a factory for making breakfasts and lunches. All you need is a freezer, a muffin tin, and then some simple ingredients. So for breakfast, you're going to take one, one large pot you're going to make over the weekend. You're really going to scoop it out and you toss it into the tins. In fact, someone come up here and help me. Who wants to, come, come over here. What's your name? Amy. Amy, here, I'll hold the mic because you gotta work. Okay. Keep scooping that in there. Okay. You, so you scoop in a little oatmeal, again, do it on sun over the weekend, and each of those pins, you're so neat. <laughs> and then add whatever toppings you want, some berries or uh, nuts, whatever you happen to like in there, cranberries, then you're gonna like put it, it in the freezer and freeze it. So mix it up, make it fun, oh, okay. whatever you desire. Now while you're doing that, I'm gonna start working on the spaghetti because for lunch, you're gonna make spaghetti freezer muffins, which is, again, take with the leftover spaghetti you've got left. That's a little sloppy, but yeah, that like this. I'm not as neat as you. You pick it in there. Some over, come, here, who else, come, someone else come down. Who else, come on down here, ma'am. We need some help in here. I can't do this by myself. I, I, got, I got a show to run here. All right, now, keep moving on those little tins. Be neater than me, though. Thank you very much. And work fast. All right, now, while you're doing that, after you do all that hard work, which takes you not much time, you're gonna put it in the freezer, and here's the best part. Reach in there in the morning when you're already late, you got 100 things going on, and you can grab these frozen specimens. Now, it's very straightforward. For the breakfast, you're gonna take out one of those muffins, that will look like this, nice and hard and solid, put it on a plate and microwave it, and it's done. Ooh. Bite into that, but only after you microwave it. No, that's <laughs> true. And then, the best part about it is lunch. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, don't bite that. <laughs> What are you doing? You're gonna break you a tooth. Told me to. No, I was kidding. Here, hold that mic. All right. Now, I'm gonna post this to my Facebook page. Make sure you share it with all your family and friends. Remember, your health and happiness start at home. See you next time. Not a bad idea.